to worship with us today. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the book of Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians is a little New Testament book. Uh, kind of in the middle, if you start with the Gospels and start turning towards the back, you go through Acts, Romans, Corinthians, and then you will find the book of uh, Galatians chapter 1. I'm going to talk for a few minutes today about what is the Gospel. What is the Gospel? Galatians 1. While you're finding way, the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one that we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we've already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how I intensely persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from birth, called me by his grace and was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. All right, let's stop there and let's just give thanks to the Lord and ask the Holy Spirit to come speak to us. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much. Thank you for your presence here. Father, I pray you kind of open our eyes. Lord, I pray that you'd open our minds, our hearts. Give us the ability to receive spiritual truths. We ask in Jesus' name, if your heart agrees, just say amen, amen. and amen. Once you've been set free from bondage, why would you ever want to go back under it again? I first started traveling in the former Soviet Union in 1991. That was the same year that the Iron Curtain came down. And I will never forget, I was just out of college, I'll never forget the utter destruction that communism left in its wake. In Warsaw, it looked like World War II had only ended like a week ago. There were still piles of rubble left everywhere from the war. Everything was overgrown. The tenement buildings that were built during the Soviet era were crooked and crumbling. It looked like the masons had been pretty loaded with vodka when they put the blocks in the buildings because they were every which way. In Russia, unemployed men were falling down drunk in the streets in broad daylight while women swept the sidewalks with homemade brooms. The shelves in the grocery stores were virtually empty. If we paid for an item with the equivalent of maybe a $10 US bill, uh, they couldn't make change. There wasn't enough cash in the till to make change for us. In Ukraine, they were still farming vast fields with hand tools and horses and wagons. From six at night to six in the morning, there was no heat and no hot water because it was centrally controlled by the government and they shut it off every evening. In the best hotels that we could find, maybe one out of every five light fixtures had a light bulb in it that actually worked. And I don't even want to tell you about the toilet paper, all right? It was last week's headlines were the toilet paper. But you know, worst of all was what communism had done to the people. The people were beaten down. They were depressed. They were repressed. They were without hope. They were living in tremendous fear. I asked some of the college students that we were ministering to, what's your impression of Americans? They said, you know, Americans are always smiling because nobody here ever smiles. During the recent Winter Olympic Games in Sochi, NBC News praised communism as one of modern history's pivotal experiments. Beloved, may it never be forgotten that 20th century communism was not a great experiment, but rather the worst idea ever. 
Communism was an abject failure. It resulted in poverty. It resulted in widespread, widespread human suffering. It resulted in death. And communism was brutally cruel, trampling over human rights, especially the savage persecution of Christians and Jews. During the 60s and 70s and 80s, my father-in-law and his brothers made dozens and dozens of trips behind the Iron Curtain. They smuggled Bibles. They took aid to the church behind the Iron Curtain, the underground church. And my father-in-law told me how pastors were arrested, how they were tortured. And he said, I, Glenn, I can't even tell you the things that were done to them. In Ukraine, I had a woman who was translating for me. She had been trained as the Soviets as a translator for the UN. She was the most unbelievable translator I've ever worked with. I would finish a sentence and she would end like a half a syllable behind me. It seemed like she knew what I was gonna say before I even knew what I was gonna say. But she had an L-shaped scar on her cheek. And she told me that when she was a little girl, she had worn a cross to school one day. And the teacher called her up in front of the class and took the cross off of her neck and held it in the palm of her hand and slapped her across the face in front of the whole class because she was a Christian, left a scar in the shape of the top of the cross on her face. Some of you might remember a woman named Gwen Shaw. She was a great servant of the Lord when I was a boy she used to teach Bible study in my mother's home. We would have all night prayer meetings and we would pray for the suffering church behind the Iron Curtain. We would pray for the fall of the Iron Curtain. We couldn't believe our eyes when the Berlin Wall came down first and then Poland was liberated and then Ukraine and then uh, many of the other Soviet bloc countries. You know, knowing all of that, it's absolutely mind boggling to me to see the headlines and to know that there's a large contingent in Ukraine that wants to go back under Russia, that wants to go back under the KGB commander Putin. I saw them in 2007. We happened to be in a city called Dnipro on May 1st, May Day, which is a massive communist holiday. And we were staying in a hotel, the one with no heat or hot water or light bulbs or toilet paper. And in the town square, right across from the hotel, there were hundreds and hundreds of people who rallied on May Day crying for communism to come back again. What a heartbreak to see on the news Ukrainian soldiers climbing flagpoles and tearing down the flag of their freedom and putting in its place the flag of bondage once again. Once you have been set free from bondage, why would you ever, ever want to go back under it again? That is the central question of Paul's letter to the believers in Galatia. It's a question that we're going to chew on together for the next couple of weeks. Paul said, I'm astonished that you are defecting so easily from the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and you're turning to another gospel that is no gospel at all. Once you've tasted freedom, once you've been free, why would you ever, ever want to go back under bondage again? When Paul picked up his pen to write this letter, to the believers in Galatia, he didn't write an ordinary letter. He wrote a letter from heaven. He wrote a letter inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak to believers everywhere in every generation. And we're going to spend a few weeks together looking at what the Holy Spirit wants to say to us through this letter. And as I look at Paul's opening lines in Galatians 1, I see an important revelation about what is the gospel. And I want to share about that with you for a few minutes today. What is the gospel? Actually, I want to begin by sharing what Paul says the gospel is not. What the gospel is not. The first thing I see Paul says is that the gospel is not a moral philosophy. This truth is at the very heart of the letter to the Galatians. During his first missionary journey, Paul preached the good news in the cities of southern Galatia. That is now where Turkey is. And he left behind him congregations of new Gentile converts who were just starting on their faith journey. But right behind Paul, as soon as Paul cleared town, there were Jewish Christian teachers who showed up and they started to confuse everybody. 
They persuaded the new Gentile believers that following Christ required them to observe the Jewish customs, especially circumcision and the kosher rules. So Paul writes this letter to tell the Galatians that the gospel is something more than a moral philosophy. The gospel is much more than aspiring to lofty ideals. The gospel is much more than a code of ethics, even one given by a higher authority. The gospel is much more than the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule. The gospel is much more than religious rule-keeping. Before Paul had had an encounter with Christ on the Damascus Road, he was a zealous Pharisee. You know, the Pharisees had six 113 rules to follow. 248 of them were positive commands. Thou shalt do this and thou shalt do that. Thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt. 365 of them were negative rules. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. They had one thou shalt not for every day of the year. Paul says, trust me on this rule-keeping thing. I have been there. I tried that. You don't want to go there. That is not the gospel. Beloved, to call the gospel a moral philosophy is to strip it of all of its supernatural power. The gospel is a radically transformed inner life by the power of God. What the gospel is not. Another thing I see, the gospel is not the invention of men. The gospel is not the invention of men. Paul spends a lot of time talking about where the gospel did not come from. The gospel was not the fabrication of the 12 apostles. It was not the concoction of the early church. It was not the innovation of a group of rabbinic students. The gospel was not the idea of Peter. It was not the idea of James, the half-brother of Jesus. It was not the idea of even Paul himself. He said, I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something man made up. I didn't receive it from a man. I wasn't taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Beloved, the origin of the gospel is God himself. You see, the gospel has supernatural force because it comes from a supernatural source. That's why the gospel has so much authority. That's why it has so much power. That's why it's still relevant. That's why it still works today because the gospel is not the words of men. It is the word of God himself. What the gospel is not. This is good preaching, by the way. Pastor Kevin and I, we spent thousands of dollars taking Bible classes, and I'm giving this to you for free this morning. So just take it all in, all right? Get as much of it as you can. What the gospel is not. The third thing, the gospel is not a theological work in progress. The gospel is not open for additional revelation. Some teachers came behind Paul and they said, well, you know, Paul, he got you off to a good start, but we've come to give you more revelation. We've come to take you up to the next level. Paul fires back at them. He said, you cannot add anything to this. Not if you're an apostolic figure, not if you're a church council, not even if you claim to be an angel from heaven yourself. You cannot add to this. And if you add anything to this, you immediately strip it of its power. Beloved, that's so important for us to know today. How many perversions of Christianity have been started because a supposed angel showed up and added something to this? That's how the Mormons started. That's how the Jehovah's Witnesses started. That's how the Seventh-day Adventists started. That's how the Christian scientists started. Do you know, Islam was started when a supposed angel showed up to Muhammad and added something. New Age practitioners claimed to receive their guidance from supposed angels. Socrates claimed that his ideas came from benevolent spirits sent from the gods. What that means is that the origin of Greek philosophy is not reason, it is demons. That's why Paul calls it science, so-called, the doctrine of demons and high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of Jesus Christ. It is the religion of the West, but how many of you know every high thing must come down and every stronghold must be defeated? 
People are claiming to add revelation to the gospel all the time. They're offering new insights into the gospel all the time. But listen, this gospel is already 100% complete. It is not evolving. It is not open for reinterpretations that fundamentally change its message. The gospel cannot be altered to satisfy the changing moral standards or sentiments of society. The gospel is immutable. The gospel is timeless. The gospel is always true, always relevant. The gospel always works. What the gospel is not. Final thing I see, the gospel is not one option among many possible paths. It's not an option. That's a, a popular religious sentiment today. That we're all on different paths, but we're headed to the same destination. Some people are on the Christian path. Some people are on the Buddhist path. Some people are on the Hindu path or the Muslim path. But Paul insists that the gospel is the only true path. Beloved, only the gospel leads to a connection with the one true God. Only the gospel leads to the knowledge of the truth. Only the gospel leads to spiritual fulfillment. Only the gospel leads to eternal life. What the gospel is not. So if the gospel is none of those things, then what is the gospel? What is the gospel? There are a few things I see in Paul's words, and I want to share them with you quickly this morning. A few things. What is the gospel? A few things from Galatians 1. First, the gospel is Jesus Christ. Beloved, Jesus is the author of the gospel. He is the subject of the gospel. He is the agency of the gospel. He is the objective of the gospel. The gospel is the historic facts of the life of Christ, verified by witnesses. Paul says he gave himself for our sins, but God raised him from the dead. The gospel is the supernatural birth of Jesus Christ. It's the sinless life of Jesus Christ. It's the substitutionary death on the cross of Jesus Christ. It's the bodily resurrection on the third day of Jesus Christ. It's the ascension of Jesus Christ. The substance of Jesus' life is the substance of the gospel. The gospel is the interpretation. It's Jesus' interpretation of the meaning of his life and death. Jesus gave that interpretation directly to the apostles along with a commission to go proclaim it. Listen to me. After Jesus died and rose again, the apostles didn't draw their own conclusions about what that meant. In fact, they had no clue what the death of Jesus on the cross meant. To them, it was a curse. To them, it was a disgrace. It was a failure. Jesus rose from the dead and he interpreted it for him. The gospel is not Peter's interpretation of the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's not Paul's interpretation of the death and resurrection of Jesus. The gospel is Jesus' interpretation of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus opened the apostles' minds so that they could understand how his life and death fulfilled all of the Old Testament scriptures. He explained to them the new covenant in his blood. He explained to Saul. He appeared to Saul on the Damascus road and revealed all of those things directly to him. Jesus entrusted the interpretation of his life and death to those apostles, and he commissioned them, go communicate it. Listen, it is Jesus' interpretation. It, it, it is Jesus' explanation of what his life and his death meant. What is the gospel? The gospel is Jesus. The gospel is a personal inner revelation that Jesus is alive and that he is Lord. Beloved, the gospel is a historic event. It's a message, and it's also a personal experience. Paul said on the Damascus Road, God was pleased to reveal his son in me. The gospel is an inner light that gets switched on by God. It's a moment when faith enters into our heart and we know in our innermost being that Jesus is the son of God, the Messiah, that he is alive and that he is Lord. Paul described it this way, God who said, let the light shine out of darkness, made his light shine inside my heart to give me the knowledge of God in the face of Jesus. That moment of inner revelation, it could happen anywhere. It could happen at any time. 
It often happens during anointed preaching or shortly after. It often happens when a believer is sharing Jesus one-on-one -on -one with somebody or shortly after. One of my favorite stories is a friend of mine who was raised in a secular Jewish home. He barely practiced Judaism, but from the time he was a small boy, he was repulsed by the name of Jesus. He said every time he heard that name, something inside of him just recoiled, something just squeezed. He just didn't like the name of Jesus. He married a girl from a nominal Christian background, and they set out together on a secular life. But on his commute home from work every day, he began to listen to Christian radio preachers. And he started to listen to them expressly to make fun of their poor logic and their hokey rhetoric. But he found that he couldn't tune their words out of his mind. In fact, he kept tuning in again, day after day after day, listening to them. And he couldn't stop thinking about the things that he heard. Until one Christmas Eve, when he was driving home, and a radio preacher said the name of Jesus. And he said all of a sudden, when he heard that name, it was like the sweetest sound he had ever heard. He said all of a sudden it was like thousands of church bells ringing, Jesus, 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 Jesus. He said it reverberated through every fiber of his being and tears started running down his face. When he arrived home, he hung up his keys and he turned around and flatly announced to his wife, I'm a Christian now. What happened to him? God switched the inner light on. I like what Karl Barth said. He said, true Christians are the victims of surprise attacks by God. He got attacked on Christmas Eve on the Hutchinson River Parkway. You know, when you've had an inner revelation of Jesus like that, you become subject to spontaneous eruptions of praise. You just can't help yourself. You just start thinking about Jesus. You start thinking about what God has done for you, and you just have a little glory fit. It happened to Paul right here while he's writing, while he's composing a letter. He begins to reflect upon everything that God has done in the cross of Jesus Christ, and he can't help himself. He has an eruption. He says, glory to God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. What is the gospel? The gospel is the transfer of Jesus' life to me. Beloved, the gospel is a supernatural exchange. Paul says that Jesus gave himself in exchange for our sins. On the cross, the sins of the world, my sins, your sins, the sins of the world were transferred on to Jesus and he gave his life in exchange. And when I have that moment of inner revelation, when I have that moment when the light switches on, when Jesus becomes alive to me, when I believe in him, what Jesus did on the cross becomes personally appropriated to me. There is a great exchange that happens. Jesus takes away my sin, and in exchange, he gives me his life. That's why Paul wrote a little further down in Galatians, it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who now lives inside of me. What is the gospel? The gospel is Jesus Christ. Another thing I see, what is the gospel? The gospel is a power encounter. The gospel is a power encounter. Paul says Jesus gave himself to rescue us. Rescue us from what? from enslavement to sin. Ultimately, the consequence of sin is death. That's eternal separation from God. But more immediately, the consequence of sin is enslavement to sin. Jesus said, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. That means the immediate consequence of sin is that I'm bound to keep on sinning. I'm bound to sin more. I can't help it. I can't stop it. I can't control it. Sin is a spiritual entity. It's a spiritual power that holds me in its grip. It has dominion over me. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. But, Jesus said, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You see, in the great exchange, there is a power encounter. 
Jesus takes my sin away from me and gives me his life. And when he takes my sin away from me, the power of sin is defeated and broken off of me. It can have no more hold over me. It can have no more dominion over me because it's not there anymore. It's gone. Christianity is a religion of rescue. Listen, Jesus, let's set the record straight here. Jesus was called the friend of sinners, not because he affirmed the sins of prostitutes and outcasts. Jesus called them sinners, sick, in need of physicians. But Jesus is the friend of sinners because he did something that the dead religion of the Pharisees could never do. He rescued people from their sin. The gospel rescues. It rescues us from self-defeating, self-destructive behavior. It rescues us from depression. It rescues us from addiction, from dysfunction, from disorder, disease. Because of the gospel, I am no longer a slave to sin. I have been rescued. I've been set free. What is the gospel? Another thing I see. The gospel is the age to come invading the present age. It's the age to come invading this present age. Paul said Jesus has rescued us from this present evil age. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus' message was the announcement that a new age had begun, that a new age had dawned. For the Jewish people, they measured time in two divisions. There was the present age and then the age to come. The present age is under the influence of Satan. It's under the influence of evil spirits. It's under the influence of sin. It's characterized by brokenness, conflict, death. The present age is humanity dominated by sin and opposed to God. The present age explains why people taste freedom and then go back into bondage again. They can't help themselves because they're under dominion of the present age. But the age to come is the age of Messiah. The age to come is the age of reconciliation and restoration. The age to come is the age of the peace of God, the order of heaven. The age to come is all of creation, everything under the dominion of God. Now here's the thing. Right now these two ages, they are running parallel with one another. The present age is here right now, but it has a time limit to it. The present age, it will come to, the, to an end. The clock is running out. The present age, it'll be over soon. The age to come, on the other hand, is eternal. Paul says God is glorified from age to age to age to age to age. It never stops. And here's what happens. During that moment of inner revelation, during that moment when the light is switched on, when I have faith in my heart, Jesus comes, he takes away my sin, he transfers his life to me, and then he picks me up out of this present age, and he moves me over into the age to come. That means that even though I'm still living here On this earth, in this present age, I am no longer dominated by it. I am experiencing a different quality of life than the rest of the world. I am experiencing different things. Life more abundantly, Jesus called it. So I'm living here in this present age, but my life is under the order of heaven. I'm living here in this present age, but I have the peace of heaven. I have the security of heaven. I have the wholeness of heaven. I have the joy of heaven. The invasion of the age to come into this present age is what makes divine healing a possibility and a reality for me. You see, spirits of infirmity, they can no longer hold dominion over me because I don't belong to this present age anymore. I belong to the age to come. Spirits of disease, spirits of death, cancer, it cannot hold dominion over me because I don't belong to this present age anymore. I belong to the age to come. Let thy kingdom come. Let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
What is the gospel? That is good preaching right there. I'm going to go home and have my own glory fit. <laughs> what is the gospel? Another thing I see. Number four, the gospel is a radical new way of living. The gospel is a radical new way of living. Paul says, you heard about my former way of life, persecuting the church savagely, destroying it. He says, but then. Beloved, that moment of inner revelation and faith, it is a but then moment in your life. It radically reorders your life. It radically reformats your life. It radically reprioritizes your life. Maybe the most radical change of all was in Paul's understanding of what true religion really is. Before Christ, Paul thought that the essence of true religion was trying to please God and please men by keeping the rules. But after that moment of inner revelation and faith, Paul realized that the essence of true religion is nothing but grace. God calls us to salvation by his grace and he calls us to live in his grace, and that's all. The gospel is a radical new way of living in that atmosphere of grace. I'm living in gratitude that God chose me. I'm living in freedom from anxiety that I must in some way please God or earn his love. What a difference when we live our life serving God out of gratitude rather than out of duty. Some of you know Pastor Melanie, our Spanish pastor here at Harvest Time. Melanie was a Catholic nun for a number of years. She was from the country of Bolivia, and the Catholic Church transferred her from Bolivia to Philadelphia. She didn't want to go. She didn't want to leave her mother. She didn't want to leave her home country. She certainly didn't want to go to Philly, but they couldn't staff the facilities and they needed people who spoke Spanish, so they transferred her. She was very unhappy. And she came to visit her sister in Port Chester one day and wanted to find a church to pray. So she went into a little church thinking that it was a Catholic church. She couldn't read the English sign. She didn't know that it was the little Assembly of God church in Port Chester. And there was meeting that Sunday evening a Brazilian youth group who was just having a glory time at the altar. They were worshiping. They were uh, just praising God in tongues and experiencing the presence of the Lord. And Melanie sat down in the back row, and after a few minutes, she realized that it was a Pentecostal church that she had come into. And she had been taught in her training that Pentecostalism was just all emotion, that it was just all hype. And so she got up to leave, but that's when she became a victim of God's grace. He arrested her. She was sitting in the pew, and she couldn't move. She was stuck frozen. She couldn't move her arms. She couldn't move her legs. She wanted to call for help, but she couldn't speak. She said that the only thing she could move were her eyes. And so she sat there trying to signal the people in the front with her eyes that uh, come and help her. She's, you know, way making eyes, and nobody's noticing her. And then she said, out of heaven, she saw the Holy Spirit coming down, descending like a giant white pearl. And when it came down and hit her on the head, she was immediately baptized in the Holy Spirit and began weeping and speaking in other tongues. So now she's sitting frozen in the pew, crying and praying in languages that she'd never learned before. For However long uh, the Brazilians went on for a while worshiping, praising God, and they finished and they started, what was that? <laughs> they went on for a while. Not as long as my sermon, but almost. And they started filtering out and somehow Melanie communicated to them, can I stay and pray? And they said, yes, you can stay. And she came to the front and she laid on the altar all night weeping and worshiping God in other tongues. In the morning when she got up, she said that everything up to that moment in her life she had ever done in service to God was a duty. It was a burden. She felt like there was some kind of debt that she 
owed God and she could never do enough. She could never pay enough. She could never make enough penance. She could never uh, say I'm sorry enough or, or, or do acts of uh, repentance and, and, and loving devotion and service. She said it was never enough. It was always such a heavy burden she carried. And when she got up after that night in the presence of the Lord, she said that that burden was totally lifted away from her and in its place was the joy of the Lord. She went out the front door of the church and she found around the side a man picking through the dumpster looking for something to eat. And she ran over and she threw her arms around him and she just kept saying, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus. He became a surprise uh, victim of an attack of God. But that's the difference between serving God out of duty and serving God out of a heart that is overflowing with love and gratitude. That's the difference between grace and duty. What is the gospel? Another thing that I see. The gospel is God's favor and wholeness delivered through a joint effort of the Father and the Son. Paul makes an interesting proclamation. He says, grace to you and peace. That word grace means the favor of God. That word peace means the wholeness of God. It's the word shalom in Hebrew. In Hebrew, it means nothing broken and nothing is missing. The completeness of God, the wholeness of God is given to you. Favor and wholeness. And Paul tells us what makes this favor and wholeness possible for us. It is a joint effort of the Father and the Son. Paul says that the Father and the Son participated in every way together in the death and in the resurrection of Jesus. The cross was the will of the Father carried out willingly by the Son. Beloved, listen, God did not force the cross on Jesus against his will. Neither did Jesus endure the cross in order to force God to forgive us against his will. The Father and the Son, they were 100% partners in the plan of salvation. They were in complete agreement. They were in complete harmony. Sometimes people have this mistaken idea, like God the Father is all the sternness, all the harshness. All the punishment, all the judgment, and Jesus the Son is all the mercy and all the kindness and all the love. It's absolutely not true. The gospel is a message about God, about his unfathomable love for us. And the Father and the Son are 100% partners bringing you personally to salvation. Before the foundation of the world, the Father willed you to belong to him. And from the moment you were conceived and every day of your life since, the Father and the Son have been working together in perfect partnership to bring favor and wholeness to you, to bring favor and wholeness to your life, to your family, to your relationships, to your health, to your finances, to every part of you. What is the gospel? Final thing I find is this, worship team, you can come help me. The gospel is the only way to have a relationship with God now and forever. Be very careful reading Paul's words here in Galatians 1. He says that to reject the gospel is to forfeit having a relationship with God. It is impossible to know God outside of the gospel. It's impossible to love God outside of the gospel. It's impossible to serve him outside of the gospel. And it's impossible to go to heaven outside of the gospel. John said, whoever does not have the son does not have the father. And whoever does not have the son does not have life. Beloved, the father and the son, they're a package deal. They come only two for one. You can't have one without the other. No one can say they have a relationship with God called by any name, anywhere, unless they have received the gospel of Jesus, his son. What is the gospel? It is Jesus. 
It is a power encounter. It is the age to come, invading the present age. God's favor and wholeness delivered through a joint effort. The only way to have a relationship with God and to have eternal life. I just want to close with two encouraging words from the Holy Spirit. The first encouraging word is this. Who's next? Who's the next Paul? Who is the next victim of a surprise attack from God? You know, it excites me to think about that. That all over Greenwich this morning, all over Fairfield County this morning, all over Westchester County this morning, all over New York City, there are people who have been set apart for salvation before the foundation of the world. And they don't know it yet, but they're about to have a surprise attack from God. And it makes me excited to think about who might be next. Who is it like Paul who was proud and headed in his own way, completely unaware that he was offending God and defying God. Who is it? Paul said, look, I was just minding my own business. I wasn't expecting what happened to me. I wasn't asking for what happened to me. I didn't want it to happen to me. But in a moment of unexpected surprise, God showed up and revealed Jesus to me. Who will be next? There are tens of thousands of Jewish people in Fairfield County and Westchester County, and they don't know it yet, but they're going to be next. There are tens of thousands of Brazilian people all over Westchester and Fairfield County. They don't know it, but they're about to be next. There are all kinds of people with killer breath like Saul, breathing out curses, breathing out harsh things and, and offensive things. They have no idea. They don't know it yet, but they're about to be next. It excites me to think that there's someone who's about to be next. Who is it going to be? It's going to be your husband. It's going to be your wife. It's going to be your brother. It's going to be your sister. It's going to be your parents. It's going to be your children. It's going to be your grandchildren. They're going to be next. They don't even know it yet, but someone is next. There's someone bound in a dead religion. They're about to be next. There's a Muslim who's about to be next. There's a Hindu who's about to be next. There's a Buddhist who's about to be next. There's a Jehovah's Witness who is about to be next. There's a Mormon who's about to be next. They're about to have an inner light, a revelation of Jesus Christ that radically reorients their whole life. Who's next? The second encouraging word I have from the Holy Spirit is simply this. If you've drifted away from faith, then just come home to grace. Paul writes to these Galatian believers who had drifted away. They had taken a wrong turn. They were headed in the wrong direction. And yet look what he says to them. He doesn't say, ah, you blew it. You, you, you made a wrong turn there. You started to believe something that took you off course. Well, that's it for you. You're finished. You're done. No, he says, brothers and sisters, just come home to grace. And he makes this apostolic proclamation over them. Favor and wholeness to you. Listen, when he writes grace and peace to you, he's not giving some chirpy little greeting. He is writing with the authority of a messenger of God. And he is speaking over those who have drifted away. No, no, favor and wholeness. It's time for you to come home to grace. Jesus sent out his representatives and he said to them, go into a home and speak peace into that home and the release of your word will change the atmosphere of that place and it will cause the order of heaven. It will cause everything within the sound of your voice to come into alignment again under the lordship of Jesus. And it was with that same spirit and that same authority that Paul speaks to these drifting Christians and he says, I say over you favor and wholeness of the Lord if you've drifted away come home to grace because your father is speaking favor and wholeness over you 
What is the gospel? It is the life of Christ in me. Come on, stand on your feet and give Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a great big praise in this place. Oh, come on, that's wimpy. Let's give him a good praise. Come on, let's give him a good praise. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, lift up your voice. How he loves us. Yes, he knows how he loves us. Lift up your face to heaven. Just lift up your arms to heaven. Come on, you just love on the Lord for one moment. Come on, would you just love, let your praise flow from your own heart to him. We love you, Lord. We worship you. We magnify you, Jesus. We exalt you, Lord Jesus. We bless you, Father. Beloved, can I tell you, the Father and the Son, they're here today working in partnership to do everything I described to you. Father and Son are here today working in partnership to give you an inner revelation of Jesus. Maybe you're next. To impart saving faith to you. To take away your sin and transfer in its place the life of Christ. To rescue you. To bring the age to come into this present age for you to introduce you to a radical new way of living, to release favor and wholeness, to bring you into a relationship with God. If you want that, I want you to just lift up your face to heaven, lift up your hands to heaven, and I want you to just take it, just receive it. Just say, Father, I receive it. Come on, just take it. I receive it. Father, I receive it. I receive it. Come on, just tell him right now, Father, I receive you. I receive the Son. I receive Jesus. I receive the gospel. Come on, I receive faith. I receive rescue. I receive an exchange. I, I receive the removal of my sins and the transfer of the life of Christ to me. I receive it. I receive the age to come invading this present age. Come on, right now, the kingdom of heaven is coming. The dominion of the beloved son is coming to rescue you. He's coming to take you out, lift you out of this present evil age and to move you over into a new existence, into a new place, into a new way of living. Thank you, Father, for the dominion of the beloved Son here in this place today that eclipses and triumphs over the present evil age. Father, I thank you, Lord, that sickness and disease, that infirmity has no authority in this place, Lord, because this is, Lord, the age of the Messiah. This is the dominion of the Messiah. This is the dominion of the beloved Son. Brokenness has no place here. Father, I thank you. Come on, lift up your hands. Father, I thank you for healing damaged and broken relationships right now in Jesus' name. Lord, thank you for healing broken and damaged marriages right now. Lord, thank you for healing broken, damaged relationships between parents and children right now in Jesus' name. This is the dominion of the beloved Son. Thank you, Father. Sickness, you can't stay in Jesus' name. Every infirm spirit, every crippling spirit, you cannot stay. You have no dominion. You have no authority over this place. This is the dominion of the beloved Son. Go in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Come on, hold us in favor. I speak it over you as a commissioned messenger of God. I speak over you. Lift up your hands. Wholeness and favor. Wholeness and favor. Wholeness and favor. Nothing missing and nothing broken in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Just receive it. Come on, lift up your hands. Just receive it. Say, Father, I receive it right now. I receive it right now. In the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, give the Lord one more big offering of praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
God bless you, everyone. I want you to remember National Day of Prayer on Thursday. Pray for our country. Wednesday night, fresh. Hey,